Welcome to Schooling Around. Today we'll focus on Chinese, the visitors, the language, the changes. Then up close and personal with one of our favorite principals, Jeff Brown. Stay tuned. Hey Lakeville, you're watching OCTV. Okay, so we're an international baccalaureate school district. Part of that means we have an international outlook, a world vision. Our previous superintendent, Dr. Bill Skilling, placed a heavy accent on China and the Chinese. He had his reasons, a big country, an interesting culture, a lot of kids who want to come here and whose parents want to pay for it. At one time, talk of a large dorm, housing 200 of those kids. That rubbed a few people in town the wrong way. And since then, no more talk of the dorm. And our Chinese resident student population has gone from over 80 to around 30, mostly due to the second year kids technically considered to be college students to live and attend school on that campus. So where are we going? There's talk of kids from other countries. We'll see. For now, let's take a look at what we have. Last month, we had kids from our sister school in Mexico, as well as Wei Ming kids from China paying a visit. Six Chinese kids from 8 to 10 years old joined our elementary kids. OES principal Jeff Brown has more. And the main reason for this exchange is it exposes all of our Oxford kids to some students with a very different background. Um, the reason that we love the homestays is it gives the families and the kids a real opportunity to get to know each other. Uh, we've been doing this or something similar to it for at least five years now and it's always heartbreaking when the kids leave how many tears there are because in the two or three short weeks the kids are with us they can build really strong relationships. Um, so it has a huge benefit for our kids as well as a great opportunity for our students that are joining us from Weiming, China. Besides that, Chinese has been a required language in our elementaries for a few years now, but that will change. <music> Ken Weaver is our Assistant Superintendent of Instruction. Recently, he introduced some striking changes in our elementary second language program. We looked at different aspects of the program and tried to measure and see with you know what the research is on world language. We also looked at um, what a survey we had recently sent out a survey to parents and see what that uh, what parents were telling us about our world language program. And then we also looked at some of the data from our stamp testing. The stamp testing is a nationally normed um, test on language ability. Um, it tests somebody's second language ability. So we looked at all those factors. Um, and then what we really made came down to a decision and looking at making changes in our world language program is really the, the current legislation over the third grade reading bill and the fact that we really wanted to look at our elementary program um, and making sure that we are doing what we can to make sure kids are reading by third grade because I don't know if you're aware, but with the third grade reading bill, if a child is not at grade level, basically, uh, they are to be retained until they can, for at least one year, or until they um, successfully get up to grade level speed on uh, their reading ability. Chinese is a level four language, which there are four levels of difficulty of world languages for English speaking. Now this is for English speakers trying to learn a, a, a world language. It is a level four, there's only four Four levels. The, the other languages that are level four are Arabic, um, Japanese, and they're really languages that really have no connection to English. Um, they are character based, they are picture based, um, they really have more to do with intonation in the words, whereas the English language obviously is based on phonetics, um, it's based off an alphabet, um, and there's really no connection between English and Chinese. So we really wanted to look at it and see what could we do to let Lessen that academic strain on our ch on, a, on our children, and also allow us to be able to um, intervene with reading. So, because we were looking at it, one of the questions on the survey was, "Would you allow your child to miss some world language time if they were having difficulty with their reading?" It came back overwhelmingly in support. The parents would say, "Yes, we definitely." Now, there were some that would say yes, 
just pull them out all the way until they 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 can breed on grade level. And there were some that said, okay, try to split 50-50, do what you can. I don't want to miss the whole um, year of language. And we realized that, and that's not what we were proposing. Is it would probably be in short bursts where they're on they're in six weeks for for intervention, trying to get their reading up, and then maybe out for a while back in the language class. So we really needed to look at a language that lined up better with a kid coming in and out and wasn't quite so difficult. So that's why we looked at Spanish Plus. Quite honestly, we probably have more Spanish speakers in the area. There's more of a chance. Most parents had, you know, if, if they've had any world language, they've had some exposure to Spanish. They can help their child a little bit more. There's more resources available for Spanish speakers. So it looked, it, it, it was determined at that point by district administration that Spanish was a better option for all kids. And that's what this decision is about. It's a decision that was made based on what is best for all kids. No. Because I can't offer both languages in the in the elementary. It's too expensive with staffing. It's too hard with elementary schedules. You can't make it work across a district as large as us, and it'd be efficient with staffing costs. So it has to be, you know, we have to look at it that we're only going to be able to offer one language, and what is that language? Um, seven years ago when this initiative was started, there was different circumstances, like I said at the beginning of this. Third grade reading bill wasn't here. We didn't have these qualifications. And so there wasn't like, hey, by third grade you have to be reading. Now with the introduction of that law, we need to make sure we're doing everything possible that we can to make sure these children are reading by third grade and so by changing that language it allows us to be more flexible with that instructional time it allows the workload on the child to ease up and we're still going to offer and Chinese is still important to our district we're still going to offer it at the middle school high school and so kids can switch in sixth grade if they really want to learn that language plus as part of my proposal we're look, I'm going to look at and see what the viability of implementing a, a track of Chinese at the elementary where the parent can opt in. This won't happen overnight. The change to Spanish will be gradual until 2020. Also, the plan includes a possible after-school opportunity to take Chinese if kids really want it. Weaver says this in no way affects IB or international students. A reaction from an elementary principal after this. OES Principal Jeff Brown has been very involved with the employment of Chinese language teachers as well as welcoming Chinese visitors and encouraging his kids in their culture and language. His thoughts. First, it always makes me a little bit sad when we have to do any type of a change because it does affect people and there are teachers that I've worked with for many years who may or may not be able to continue in their current position. So I'm always sad when any program changes impacts people, but there are also some great opportunities that are going to come to our kids from having the opportunity to switch from Chinese to Spanish. And the opportunity that I'm most excited about is the opportunity to have real conversation with students in Mexico. Uh, China has been challenging because of the 12 hour time difference and so now I'm really excited and looking forward to the opportunities through Skype and the other opportunities through technology for our kids to be able to connect directly with other kids in Mexico. Uh, it, the languages are always fantastic but the part of a language that's very interesting to me is, is the cultural side, the connection side between people and I think with starting to build a relationship for Oxford Elementary school with Mexico we will be able to much easier have that people human connection for our kids. Jeff Brown has been an elementary principal in our district for a few years now. I recently spent some time with him discussing his feelings, his job, and his future. Next. Hey Leonard, you're watching OCTV. Jeff Brown is the principal of Oxford Elementary School. He's been at it now for a while. He has kids of his own, some there, and coaches a couple of sports on the side. We talked about how time has flown. It seems like just yesterday I was out here recording the ceremony of the kids, the, 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 the graduation ceremony sure. in the cafeteria with all the kids up on the stage and everything. And, and here we are, it's going to happen all over again. Mm -hmm. Another year has gone by. Mm -hmm. How many years have you been doing this? Uh, I believe this is 19 years for me. 
Um, as a principal? This is my eighth year as a principal here at Oxford Elementary. Uh, two years as a middle school assistant principal in our district. Uh, two years before that as a principal in Montague, and seven years before that as a teacher with Detroit Public. So you taught down in Detroit? I did. Um, I taught fourth grade for five years in Detroit Public and seventh and eighth grade math for two years with Detroit Public. I often think, since I've been doing what I do, about how special a job a teacher really is because of all the people they have an opportunity of making an impression on and how long they remember you. I mean, I remember my teachers from eons ago. Sure. All these kids with all these memories, it boggles the mind, doesn't it? It is, it's, through technology, it's been really nice. Through Facebook and places like that, it's made it easier to connect with former students. Uh, to me, one of the most satisfying things is, is seeing the life progress of some of the kids that you've at least had a small influence on. Um, I've connected over the last couple of years with quite a few of my former students in Detroit. Uh, I came across a box that had a bunch of my old class photos and so I just started going into the Facebook search and typing in names um, hoping to track some people down and I don't know I probably found 20 or so of the the 100 or 150 elementary kids that I taught and it's just been fun to just get that little bit of a window into their world. Um, it, it feels really good. But when you think about how many more of them must think about you from time sure. to time, and I think it's got to be a great feeling. It is, and I think you know, I think teachers in general um, do take a lot of pride in that, and I think that's what makes our job feel very serious on a day-to-day -day basis. Is we do know that you know we spend 180 days with kids for six or seven hours a day, which is way more time in the span of a year than most parents are able to spend with their children. Um, so that's a huge responsibility. That's a big deal, and I think we all feel the the weight of that. Are you originally from Oxford? I'm not. Um, I grew up in Bay City, Michigan. Uh, I attended Bay City schools all the way through high school. Um, so yeah, Bay City, born and raised. So was it this job that brought you to Oxford? Uh, it was. So when I was looking to become an administrator, um, Detroit Public Schools was going through a lot of downsizing. Uh, I'd actually gone through an administrative academy in Detroit. We were basically promised administrative roles the following year, but unfortunately in Detroit that was the very first year where the downsizing really started happening. Uh, their central office staff was cut dramatically. Central office people were then becoming the principals, and I really wanted to become a principal at that point in life, and the opportunities in Detroit just weren't there because because of the downsizing. Um, I got my first job on the west side of the state in Montague. Um, as a new principal, it's pretty hard to get into Oakland County, but I was able to find that position in Montague. Um, my family decided that my, my wife's family was all from this part of the state, and we had young kids, and we decided that Montague just couldn't work for us, and that's how we ended up coming back to this side of the state. Montague is close to? Montague is just north of Grand Haven. Okay, it's a pretty area over there. It was a gorgeous area. Lake Michigan? Right on the lake. Uh, we lived about a mile and a half from the lake. I could jog to the lake. Uh, we were a beach community uh, where Montague was. It was a beautiful spot. But having young kids and having family all back on this side was a hard combination. Were you a principal there? Or? I was. I was an elementary principal there what for two year years. Uh, oh, let's see. 12 years ago would have been my first year there. So 2005 ish. Okay. When you were in, well, let me ask it to you this way. Did you always want to be a teacher? Um, I think I always knew deep down inside that I wanted to be a teacher. When I went away to college, I spent two years doing the pre-med curriculum, uh, mostly because my dad was a dentist. I grew up around a lot of doctors, and that was sort of the expectation of me. Uh, two years into college, actually two years and two weeks into college, um, I made the decision that education was what I really wanted to do. Uh, I made that decision. I'd been volunteering at the hospital in Ypsilanti. Um, 
I was working from 12 o'clock till about four in the morning. Uh, my, my volunteer job at that hospital was delivering the drugs from the pharmacy to the nurses that needed it for the patients. And I'm looking around the hospital at how all the people who are working there are feeling, working from 12 o'clock at night to four in the morning. And just so many people looked unhappy that I sort of had that life epiphany of, I don't think I can do this for the next 30 or 40 years. So did your mom and dad look you in the eye at that point and say, are you really sure about this? I think they, they might still think I'm a little bit crazy for the decision, but at the time they absolutely thought that I was nuts. Um, I think they knew I was passionate about it, and I think they knew that it was something that I always liked. Um, my little brother is 13 years younger than me, so even when I was in college, I was volunteering, coaching his baseball team, and helping with things like that in the summertime. Um, so I think they knew that I loved working with kids. I think they were concerned that teachers don't make any money. Um, people don't respect teachers as much as they should. I think they had a lot of worries about that for me. Um, I do think now that they look at my life and my career, I think they're proud of what I've been able to do. So is this what you had your eye on in college? Um, my my undergraduate degree is in um, K-8 education um, with a math endorsement and a science endorsement. So yeah, I knew that elementary or middle school was the age group that I liked the best. And uh, I know you, you've already gone through your list of schools, but what schools were you a teacher in? So I was a teacher at Pulaski Elementary School in Detroit. I'm in the northeast corner of Detroit. And then Brenda Scott Middle School opened as a brand new school while I was there. And it was actually the middle school that my elementary school fed into. Um, so when that brand new building opened, I took the opportunity to move with my kids uh, into the new building. That was a baptism by fire, teaching in Detroit right off the bat. There were definitely some challenges to Detroit, but I think when in any school you've got most of the kids are really good and there's always a couple that are a little more challenging than others and that was definitely my experience in Detroit but by far the majority of kids were great kids that would be a great fit in Oxford um, and there were some hard kids too uh, materials lack of materials was definitely a, a challenge there sometimes um, class size was a huge challenge there um, even at the elementary level I very often had between 35 and 40 kids uh, we would never run a class in Oxford in an elementary with that many children in it. Um, so there were certainly some challenges, but I, I love my time in Detroit. Is there a particular memory that sticks in your mind about teaching in Detroit? Um, my favorite thing, there's a few. Uh, we always had pen pals with um, a school outside of Detroit and each year we would go on a picnic at the end of the year and go meet our pen pals and that was always a really neat thing because we would built a relationship over the course of the year and to actually see the kids meet at the end was a really positive experience for everybody and that was something that I enjoyed tremendously. Uh, the other one that stands out is um, as our Christmas time project, um, somehow I got the idea to build like model airplanes. And so I always made the investment of buying a model airplane for every kid. We would build them over the last week and then we'd go fly them in the gym because it was still cold outside. And the process of having to follow directions and the precision that was needed was always fun. But kind of that joy of actually seeing the airplane fly at the end was a really neat thing too. And that project base, that hands-on, but also that fun part of what we did um, is also definitely a memory that'll stick with me forever. And what was the drawing card for Oxford? Uh, to be completely honest, I needed a job on this side of the state. It was it's really that simple. Um, it was still in an economic time where there were not a lot of positions available. Uh, we had made the family decision that we wanted to come back, and so I knew the area reasonably well because of my wife and I started applying for positions that were available. Um, I interviewed with Oxford real early, probably in April, and I really liked the people that I met. I really liked the district. Um, I was actually interviewing with a neighboring district at the same time for an elementary position, and Oxford offered me the position first. 
I was real nervous about taking a middle school assistant principal position because some people might look at that as sort of a career step backwards. But with talking with Oxford, they had some older elementary principals that they knew that were going to be leaving over the span of the next year or two. Uh, Oxford made the commitment to me, if you come in and do a good job for a year or two and show us that you're good at what you do, we will move you into one of those elementary positions. Um, so I took that challenge. I, I came in. Oxford moved me from the middle school to the elementary school just as promised, um, and they held up their end of the deal. And since then, it's been a great eight years at the elementary. Was being a principal any different than you thought it would be? I think when before you become a principal you don't really appreciate some of the the minute to minute day to day things of what you do um, I knew it would be a lot of work I always knew it would be a lot of time um, but the amount of time that I spend more with a counselor hat on than a principal hat is probably more than what I would have expected and I think that's a good thing um, kids are what I love to to be involved with and I do get a lot of time to actually work with kids whether it's on behavior whether it's on academic issues um, that part has been fantastic uh, living in the community and being in the same building for eight years one of the things that surprised me is the relationship or the strength of the relationships that you build with certain families along the way um, it's a lot more close-knit than what you would think uh, the relationship between a principal and a family is definitely a lot tighter than what I ever imagined. Um, the other one that's very different, especially after being here for eight years, is you know you think of the principal as the the boss, the one who gets to make decisions. And when you're working with professional teachers, getting to just make a decision is not the way it works very often. Um, I spend a lot of my time talking with teachers, negotiating, convincing, having ongoing dialogue about what would be best for our building. Because if the teachers don't believe in the decisions that we make, they're not going to follow it. And so that, that consensus building, that process of earning trust is a lot more important to the job than what I ever thought it was going to be also. You've had your own kids in your school, haven't you? I do. So my son is a seventh grader at the middle school, so he's come all the way through. Um, my daughter is a fourth grader here right now, and my two stepchildren are both third graders in the building. Um, What's that like, having your own kids in your school and you're the boss? Nothing better. Um, at the high school or middle school, I don't know that I would put the kids through being in the same building with me, but at the elementary building, I think the majority of kids still look at me as more like the rock star than the terrible, awful person. Um, so I think my kids can appreciate that. Uh, I get to see all my kids' school events, or at least a whole lot of them. Um, if I'm having a bad day, I walk onto one of my kids' classes and say, hey, you got to give me a hug. I'm having a rough day. I just I need a minute. Um, when my kids forget something at home, I live three minutes away and I go get it for them. Uh, when they're sick, they come down to my office and sit in the beanbag chair if they need to sometimes. Um, so those are tremendous perks. Uh, the other part is my children, you know, they, they practically live here. Uh, when I work on the weekend, they want to come up and be in the gym. Uh, to be honest, they've ripsticked in the hallways before. Uh, so some of those perks are pretty tremendous. Um, but it is, it is a really nice feeling to sort of have your work life and your home life mesh together the way mine are. Is your wife a teacher? Uh, she is. She is a teacher in Waterford um, for young kids with disabilities. As with any job, being a principal isn't all fun and games. Sometimes you have to pick up that phone. It's really hard calling a family when your kid has done something that they shouldn't have done. Um, we prefer to have positive conversations. I love to call home and say, hey, your kid just did this, it was awesome. It's hard to make that phone call home when a kid is messed up. Um, and kids do, that, that's the, the beauty of the third, fourth, and fifth grade age is they are still kids. They do make mistakes sometimes. And the huge majority of our families when I make that call are, I'm so sorry for their behavior, it won't happen again, they wanna work with us. And you know sometimes it's the first time that a family's ever had the call home that their kid is messed up. Um, so that is hard, it's, it's a hard thing. Nobody wants to discipline kids. Uh, we wanna be able to hug them and tell them how great they are. But 
you know, the reality is it is important that kids learn from their mistakes and that's a, a part of my job that I do have to do. It is very rewarding when it works well and a kid learns from it and grows. Um, there's nothing better than having a third grader that came in that had some challenges and all of a sudden at fifth grade they're leaving and you feel like they're in a way better spot than where they started. But the, the student discipline part is hard and it's not that fun always. I thought I'd throw some words at Jeff. First one was government. Um, we're a public school. Uh, the government's in charge of us at a whole bunch of different layers and it seems like every layer of government has got an opinion of how we should be doing our jobs. Um, I'm a very firm believer that the government is trying their very best to intervene with public education. I am almost a, I'm also a very firm believer that the high stakes decisions should be made by educators. And I guess I am worried sometimes that maybe that's not always the case. But I guess as a principal, I do respect authority enough that I do believe that the people that are making decisions are trying to make the best possible decision. So what would you change? I certainly wish that we had a little bit more money, um, and I know money is not the answer for everything, but money does provide flexibility for us to offer different things, and I wish that we did have that extra resource pool to be able to offer, for example, more computers, more time for kids to learn to code, more opportunities to explore in science. Um, more time in the day so that we could have a little more recess art and PE. Um, that would be huge for our kids. Uh, and so again, money, money can't be the only option, but it does give us the opportunity to have some more resources. Uh, I also wish that there was this perfect test that existed out there where you could measure the amount of knowledge that we've imparted on a kid over the course of a year. I don't think that there's anybody that really knows how to design that yet. So I'm not thrilled with state testing, but I still default to I think that the people that are creating the tests are working as hard as they can, but I don't feel that there's that measure that exists of how much we've added to an individual kid. And the other part is, I do think that schools serve a much bigger function in our world than just teaching the traditional subjects. I think we teach our kids a ton about character. I think we prepare them for being a grown-up, and some of that goes well beyond reading, writing, math, and science. I wish there was a way to measure how much a kid grew in some of those social areas, in their confidence, in their love of learning. Um, I wish there were some ways that we could measure that a little bit better. And I wish that there was a little more value sometimes that was placed on some of those other things, or other ways that a school contributes to a child. The next word, future of education. Um, the online world is becoming more and more a part of what our kids do, uh, which is both a wonderful thing because it opens doors and expands opportunities, but it's also a scary one, especially for elementary age kids who I still think need a teacher guiding um, that process. So that's something that makes me very, very nervous. Um, the whole charter school, public school debate is one that makes me nervous because I am a firm believer that the reason we do this is we want all kids to have an opportunity to learn. and as I hear about vouchers and, and all these different systems, it worries me that that equal to access to education could be something that become an issue um, over time. Uh, when I look at our district here in Oxford, there are other districts in Michigan that receive a bigger foundation grant than we do. Is that fair? How is that gonna play out over time? Um, those are probably my biggest ones. I guess the other ones are, when I look at some of the opportunities that are available to kids when they're 18, 19, 20 years old, I do wonder whether a traditional education is the best path to get them ready for that next phase of life. Um, there are a lot of jobs out there that are so technical and so specific that kids may need different training than what we have to offer. And as a school, we've got to figure out a way to offer what the kids need. And I think there's a lot of gray area of what's the best way to do that right now. And finally, the future of Jeff Brown. Boy, that's a great question. Um, there are days when I say I'd love to be sitting at Oxford Elementary School for the next 10 years. Uh, there's a, a few days when I walk out of here saying I don't know if I can come back tomorrow. Um, there's some things that I know for certain about my future. I am complete, completely committed to this profession. Um, I love being here. There's no other job, no other profession that I would ever want to have. 
I am hitting the point in the career where I've been in the same building for eight years and I've been an elementary principal now for 10. Um, I am getting to the point where I might like to shift my niche just a little bit. I've explored the idea of being a high school principal. I've explored the idea of maybe moving into central office. Um, I'm actually going back to the fall, back to school in the fall to U of M Flint uh, to pursue an ed specialist in education. Um, that'll probably open a few doors for me. But to be honest, if, if I had to make a bet, I would say five years from now I'll be sitting here at Oxford Elementary School as the principal. And 20 years from now, the other question I get a lot is how do you want to end your career? And I do have a passion for Detroit and for urban education. I would love to spend my last few years back in that environment. And you know, right now I have young kids. Uh, I coach soccer, I help coach baseball. Um, I'm very involved in their world. When I don't have all those responsibilities, I would love to do a shift in job just a little bit and maybe go back to a spot like Detroit and spend my last few years there um, really trying to do something amazing. That's Jeff Brown, principal of Oxford Elementary School. That's this edition of Schooling Around. As always, thanks to Kyle Snage at the controls, Dan Weiss at the editing desk, and you for watching. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local.